Thanks so much for the generous introduction. Uh, it's something that's always great to be back here in Hyderabad. So I, I think for, for a lot of you guys, probably the, the obvious question uh, is sort of why. Uh, so the first, when I ever I, I meet with someone or I'm introduced, uh, you know, always the initial question is always, so you know, why are you here? Why are you doing Zoom car? What made you kind of, what really compelled you to, to travel, you know, 15,000 kilometers to, uh, to come and start this off? And you know it's it's definitely you know a very very fair and valid question. So I think I'll just start off and give a little bit more color, uh, give a little bit more insight into into that, and, and kind of go and, and snowball from there. So I, I think for me, you know, of course, I'm I'm American. Uh, I, I grew up born and raised in New York City. Uh, something that I went to school uh, at the University of Pennsylvania at Wharton, uh, which is one of the larger business schools uh, in the U.S. And so my focus, uh, so I studied international relations actually. So I studied. Uh, about India and China in school, and uh, actually had a lot of really good buddies, a lot of friends uh, who were from here, uh, from various cities in India. Uh, so Penn actually has one of the largest uh, Indian communities uh, of any of the Ivy League schools in the U.S. Uh, and it was something. So I was fortunate. I had a lot of good buddies who were from here, and I was actually studying India uh, and China because at the time, you know, I was this was 2003, 2004, five, six, seven. Uh, that was uh, a time when India was really thriving, really starting to come up and and move very, very quickly. And for me, uh, as someone who always would love to travel as a, as a young kid, uh, I always knew I wanted to, to do something here uh, which could be you know, potentially very impactful. And, but of course, at that time, I was 19, 20, very wet behind the ears, had no idea what I really wanted to do, uh, except for the fact that you know, this is like a really you know, cool, interesting, potential prospect uh, in the future. And so kind of for me, fast forwarding a little bit, uh, so when I graduated school, uh, I actually, my, my first job was actually in finance. But I went to work for a bank that focused uh, within energy and clean tech. So at that point, uh, doing work in solar, wind, energy storage, uh, biomass. So I was always really interested in sustainability, and so thinking about development uh, kind of in the right kind of way. And so because you know, this was a challenge that the U.S. was facing, it's a challenge that India was facing, China. All of these countries were facing this problem fundamentally you know, about clean power, about sustainable transport, you know, how you can do this sort of at scale. And you know, for me, I thought a great way to do that initially was to think about uh, finance and, and think about how you could make a, a large-scale impact on projects, et cetera. And I, I was fortunate where uh, this was 2007, 2008, 2009. I had an opportunity to actually work a lot in India. I had an office actually here uh, over in Secunderabad. And so we, we did a lot of deals uh, across pan-India, uh, again, looking at sort of wind, solar, uh, coal to gas, so a lot of these clean infrastructure, clean energy deals trying to make a large disruptive impact. Uh, the, the challenge, as probably a lot of you guys know, uh, is when you're, you're trying to do something like that, where these are you know, 2,000, 3,000 core, 5,000 core projects, they're very large projects. Unfortunately, in India, the, the context, these things often get stymied by the government. There's a lot of regulatory involvement. Uh, it's not too, you know, pretty soon thereafter, I was at the point where I was totally jaded and was like, no, I, I can't deal with this. Like, I, I want to do something really impactful. This is a, it's an awesome opportunity to, to make a huge impact here in India. But, you can't do it this way. I mean, I, I wanted to do it before I had all my hair fall out and uh, before my grandkids were born. So uh, it was something where I said, well, okay, you know, how, how do you kind of go about doing something which is going to be really impactful sort of from the sustainable development side? How do you do that without having to worry about all this governmental largesse and so this uh, sort of chicanery? And so I said, well, why not do something really, just think about a, a technology company, uh, really do something really from the ground up bottom up, where you have a lot of virality, a lot of network effects, where you can sort of leverage, really leveraging social media, uh, think about how you can use that as a tool, and, and create this really large groundswell and really large impact, which can become, again, very, very viral and very disseminated, and so you can touch, uh, hopefully, millions of, millions of folks. Uh, and that was really sort of the idea, is if, if you could you know, build a business that were kind of around those principles. And you know, for me, coming from the finance side, coming from the energy side, infrastructure side, uh, you know, I, I knew that there were a lot of large-scale problems to be cracked. But for me, uh, and, and again, as a citizen of New York and someone who had traveled globally a lot, I uh, realized that when, whenever you're thinking about really big cities, uh, one of the core problems is sort of the personal mobility, thinking about uh, car ownership, thinking about uh, really how you can kind of get from point A to point B in around the city, and then you know, coming back again, going roaming across the city, going outside the city, how you can really do that in a very fluid, very convenient, flexible way. Those are really challenging, really exciting problems to tackle. And, and looking at it uh, in the Indian context, and this was in early 2011, uh, when I was really starting to think about what opportunities could be done here, 
and you know, saw that you know, no one was doing anything around sort of self-drive car rental in any Indian city. Uh, it, it was just no one had even conceived it. Uh, and for me and, and my co-founder, David, at the time, it was, it was totally stunning. Because for us, it, it was like an aha moment. And someone like, hit us over the head with a hammer. Because if you look out in, in China, in Europe, in South America, in, in North America, uh, it, it really, it, it's, this is a thriving model in all of those places. Now, the iterations, it behaves a little bit differently in China than it does, say, in, in London. Uh, but it, it was something which had actually uh, came up and, and thrived in all these places. And the fact that it wasn't in India, to me, uh, seemed like a, an outrage and seemed like a, a crime. And, and so, again, my, my co-founder and I, we, we decided, well, look, this is something that we earnestly do want to take a shot at. And, and this was in uh, 2011 uh, and then into 2012, spent three months on the ground, kind of, again, moving around, roaming across different cities, uh, talking to thousands of people, uh, such as yourselves, uh, just kind of getting feedback in a both a qualitative and quantitative way. We did market research and all those good things. Uh, but I think ultimately it, it was really about just having the the conviction, knowing that you know, this is really uh, a problem where you know there is sort of a, a market fit to what we're trying to do. And so we had enough validation in in all of these you know, several thousands of discussions and this research that you know we knew that this was something where. Okay, we didn't know how large it was going to potentially be, but we knew there was, it was an opportunity that was definitely worth pursuing. And, and that was something which really got us really excited. That's why I was really motivated to do it. And ultimately, for me, now at that time, on a personal level, I was living in Los Angeles. I was actually in business school. So in, in the U.S., as you, as you probably know, most of the business schools, you know, two-year programs, uh, unlike, in, unlike in Europe, uh, where you actually then, you know, typically the path is, you know, you go to school, you, know, you go out, you become a consultant or a, a banker, you work in, in whatever... Uh, I knew I obviously didn't want to do that. I knew I wanted to take the plunge. And so after one year, I actually dropped out of business school. So I dropped We had actually raised a little bit of money. Uh, at, that, at that point in time, uh, it, w it wasn't particularly a lot of money. We raised about 60 lakh uh, of, of money initially. And I put in uh, money from my own savings. And basically, all of my life savings were, were into this uh, at that point. And so I realized that it, it was something which you know, was worthwhile and wanted to actually, again, take that, take that leap. And so of 2012, I actually shifted and moved to Bangalore, uh, so I haven't really looked back. But I think what was really interesting, uh, and uh, I'll kind of get into a more general uh, discussion uh, on, the, on the technology side, but uh, what we were actually extremely close to starting the business, and totally kind of going under before we even got uh, up and running, so to speak. I mean, this was uh, in October, November, December of 2012. Uh, we, our, our plan was actually initially to launch the business in October. Uh, we, we thought that we were going to be able to obtain a permit, uh, a self-drive permit from the government in a you know, very short time frame based on all this feedback we were getting. So we need this license to run our business. And uh, unfortunately, it was something where we were stymied multiple times in Bangalore to try to do this. And you know, we, we were in a position where <clears throat> we actually literally didn't know how to actually start the business because we need this license to run the business. But unfortunately, we couldn't partner with anyone at the time. And, and so there was no real way for us to actually have cars come in to the system and, and put them onto the road. So this was in early December of 2012. I actually purchased a ticket home for Christmas. Uh, I didn't purchase a return ticket because I, I didn't know if I was going to be able to come back and, and actually start the business. So at that point, it was definitely a very very low point in the, the whole journey. Uh, but the, the point here and the, the reason I'm, I'm telling on this is because ultimately we you know, had, uh, and someone so very similar to, to Bashir here uh, in, in Bangalore, uh, who actually was extremely helpful, a Ford dealer, in fact, uh, who helped with an introduction to uh, a local tours and travels operator who sort of, at the last minute, uh, on December 23rd, the day before I was going to fly home, we, we inked a deal to actually license uh, his cars. And so, and basically attach his cars where he had a license. He was one of the five license holders in the state. So we were literally down to our absolute last breath. And, and that was something where, you know, obviously very, very grateful for all those relationships that we had built. But... It just goes to show, I think, for us, and just to communicate to you guys, and how you know, really you know, it's about, especially in the early days. I mean, perseverance is—it's often very much uh, so. It's a buzzword, but I think it's definitely something that has to be uh, appreciated and looked at you know, very, very closely. Because that, I mean, in the face of, of all of this, uh, when when you're starting off, I mean, having that sort of resilience and just sort of more hard-headedness, uh, more sort of obstinance, I would say, uh, around that is, uh, is is really, really, really critical. Uh, and so, you know, fortunately, we were blessed with the opportunity to, to get to that point, get over that hurdle, and then we ended up launching the business about two months later in, uh, in February of 2013. And, and from there, at least on the government side, 
uh, things have been a lot a lot smoother. Uh, you know, so touch touch wood. But so what I really want to then, you know, that's a lot of the the sort of backstory for me and on, on a personal level. And you know, I think I, I wanted to touch on sort of mainly sort of three three main features sort of highlights, if you will, uh, that sort of I, I've seen and, and come across in, in the journey thus far. And you know, I think just three pretty simple simple things. So nothing nothing too uh, earth shattering, but I, I think they're very very meaningful, very impactful. Uh, for for both for both me and my team, and then hopefully maybe for some of some of you guys, it can be helpful in some ways uh, as you're starting off as well. And so I think really for for me the first point that's overarching, and I, I think in in some cases it gets taken for granted, uh, but it, it's really so when when you think about your mission, the company's mission, the purpose, uh, it's it's super critical. And of course, you as a founder and uh, co-founders, uh, you guys will all have that because you were there. In the trenches from the beginning, right? So you started everything, no matter what you're doing. If I'm if I'm doing a clean energy startup, if I'm doing a, a self drive car rental startup, if I'm doing a, a, a B2B SaaS play, if I'm doing something in logistics, it really doesn't matter what it is. You you know, as an entrepreneur, you're obviously going to have the passion for it, right? You're going to believe in what you're doing. You're going to think it's the most important thing in the world, and you know, maybe maybe you're right. But the point is, other other guys who are going to join your team uh, are not necessarily always going to believe that, and you know, inherently. They don't believe the, the same. They're not going to have the same convictions. And really, the the number one point that I was mentioning in this is that you really have to make everyone uh, in, in your company. Uh, it's absolutely critical. You have to make everyone feel like owners, not employees. So I say we we call it sort of like the army of one, so to speak. You know, so you know, you, you want to have that sort of buy-in from everyone that you hire, and it's really really critical that everyone across. So. You know, it, it may be even someone like a, a call center executive. Uh, if you have a call center executive, it, it doesn't matter. It has to be every single person that has that buy-in with that vision, with that mission, and sort of where where you're going. And, and so really for us, I mean, that, that was something where particularly it's, it's probably a little bit easier to articulate uh, compared to uh, some other companies just because we have a sort of very operational presence where you, you can see the cars every day. Uh, and that's something which uh, is a little bit easier for folks to kind of bite on and chew on. Uh, and so for us, like for for me, the context for us is that we say simply put, you know, for every car that we can put on the road, we we take off road about 20 cars that otherwise would be purchased or uh, roaming, plying in various capacities. And so and when we say, well, you know, well, what does that mean actually? And so one one of those cars, actually, one car that we put on road, those 20 cars, I mean, that's that's around 350 tons of CO2 that you're talking about over the life of of a car. And and so you can then equate that out and say that's around the equivalent of 1,400 trees uh, that uh, would, would otherwise not be there. I mean, so it's, it's like if you're planting that many trees. So the, the point is that that's kind of the imagery that we like to that I like to paint when, when I'm talking to people. And you know, I, of course, you know, when we're talking about hiring engineers, product people, uh, guys in various, you know, a lot of them. Okay, some people you often maybe get jaded, think okay, some people are sort of chasing the money. Let's say because you know, they were a well-funded startup, and so we, we raised. Decent amount of money, and, and we pay pretty good salaries, and so. But yeah, I think it, what's really, really important is that you kind of cut through all that nonsense, um, and you, know, you make sure that you know, someone really relates on sort of a one-to-one -one level into sort of the mission of the company. And I, I think that's really, really, really critical because too, too often I, I see you know, companies uh, lose that attachment, and and then especially when you're dealing with people who are at like a mid-level or senior level, uh, when, when you're thinking about uh, your, your management team. Uh, you really absolutely have to have that because the reality is, you know, okay, I work obviously I work over 100 hours a week. You know, you're you're working nonstop. You work seven days a week. You, you're working 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Uh, and that that's going to be there, right? So the point is, you want to have people uh, who can kind of be there alongside you in that journey. And so you want to have those uh, those senior leaders who can who can do that because that's really what it takes, uh, regardless, irrespective of of any business you're running. So again, going back to the point, sort of. Owners, not employees. So you know, I think that the second point uh, for for me that's that's really really critical is you know, you, you want to promote, you want to create sort of diversity across the team. Uh, so you want to to really think, especially for your senior leaders, uh, you know, for maybe the sort of eight, ten, twelve top senior leaders, you want to have guys who come from very just sort of different backgrounds and have very very different perspectives. So you know, sort of point counterpoint, sort of juxtaposition. Uh, oftentimes, you, know, you have sort of cognitive dissonance. I think the worst thing uh, with a, with a startup. I think this goes true probably for for larger companies too. Uh, 
uh, is that you know, too often you have guys who are, I mean, everyone's from IIT Delhi or something, or everyone went to ISB here uh, in, in Hyderabad. And, you know, this is just an example. But when you get people from the, sort of the same background, the same schooling, um, you know, it's just you, you get too much groupthink, too much of the mentality where you know, they, they kind of don't challenge each other, don't push each other, don't have these sort of these contradictions, these juxtapositions. I mean, that ultimately, when you have people, let's say, you know, and it could be, could be geographical, could be educational, uh, you know, it could be, okay, their, their parents uh, were, were doing something altogether different. But I think, you know, how the, the mentality and the mindset that they, they have and bring, uh, you, you really need to have four or five, six different kinds of mindsets. I mean, that's ultimately what makes so many startups and so many companies thrive. And I, I hear it actually all the time from our investors. So our, our largest investor is Sequoia Capital. Uh, they're one of the larger venture funds here in India. Uh, they actually, the partner who's on our board, he, he actually would tell me this all the time as well, saying that, you know, it's, it's something where, and he actually cautioned when we raised our first round of funding from them last year, uh, you know, when, when you think about you know, hiring, you know, make sure you, you're not going to hire like guys who are just like all sort of like just buddies. Uh, you don't want to have like buddies in the same batch or just you know people who are you know, too aligned because again you know, then you kind of get all sorts of sort of negative vibes uh, that that come from that and I, I think that's that is really important it's it's not something that's really discussed as much but you know as as you're growing and just to give some more concrete examples like as you step up and, and grow as a business like for us you know, we've around 2,000 cars today across India we're in we're in seven cities uh, but you know as we went from 100 cars uh, which was for us back uh, sort of the beginning part of 2014 uh, to the number today, you know, at each sort of inflection point and step along the journey, uh, your organizational chart is going to change uh, a fair amount. And so you know, the other point that sort of dovetails and tied into this larger point around having sort of the diversity of thought, it's you, know, you have to be very, very uh, fluid and flexible in your thinking around the overall organizational chart. And it's something you, you don't want to obviously it never makes sense to create hierarchy for hierarchy purposes. It never makes sense to put in managers for managerial purposes. I mean, we, we're a very flat company. I mean, we have some, some light hierarchy, of course, but it's, it's very much uh, a flat structure where you know, people can, ideas can raise up and, and percolate up. And you know, again, having this sort of diversity of thought uh, across the teams, it, it really, really does help. And, but I think one, one sort of sub-point from this is that you, know, you really have to think about Again, as you're going, in our case, 100 cars, 500 cars, 2,000 cars, you have to be willing and you have to really push to uh, strive to actually disrupt your own organization from a, an overall sort of systematic perspective. You know, so if I, you know, if I have X many folks and, and sort, of, you know, sort of senior leaders on the, on the product team and they engage with the engineering team or they engage with the marketing team this way, you know, that, that may work fine uh, for 100 cars in our case, or it may work if you have a revenue of six cores, uh, Let's say, but if if you you know then have a revenue of 50 crores, you know, it, it may not work. It may, it may not make sense. And so, one thing that we've learned, sort of tied into this this principle of having sort of diverse thought, you you need to be fluid and flexible with your sort of organization to to be able to to do that and, and move that needle and, and do it quickly too. Because I think if, if you're not willing to do that, and then if you're having sort of the buddies uh, that that are always there, so to speak, uh, what what ends up happening is a company can get very much into a rut. Uh, and culture is a very slippery thing in the, in the company. You probably hear this spoken about all the time from you know, business school professors, etc. Uh, but when you, you have uh, an inflection point, or when you have something which, which happens, which ultimately moves culture sort of in, in a negative way, uh, you, know, you have to arrest that very, very quickly. And so that's why this principle, I think, is so important, because it, it helps you kind of stay focused and, and realize that you know, certain things you know, need to be dealt with uh, very, very quickly for the, for the betterment of the, the company. So... That, that's the, the second main point there. And then, so the, the third really, really big point uh, for, for me is, and I think in, in some ways from an operations perspective, from a customer perspective, uh, th this is really the most critical uh, because when, when you're really thinking about your, your business, and again, it goes back to, to any kind of company, for our company specifically, what, um, what it really is, what it, what it really uh, kind of boils down to is the, the fact that as you grow, and again, I use the example of when you go from 10 cars to 50 cars to 2,000 cars, and you spread out one city, five cities, 10 cities, uh, the thing that is oftentimes the most difficult is the ability to sort of maintain uh, an unbelievable, unparalleled customer experience uh, across. So, you know, it's, of course, when you have a very small presence, it's easy because you yourself can control everything. Uh, you can be there, in fact, as people ask, you know, what happened, what was your, your first call center, 
and say, well, I was our first call center executive. So I'm, the, I'm the CEO, but I was our first call center executive. I was our first fleet executive. So uh, I was on the ground serving customers. I was cleaning cars. I was, I was speaking to customers over the phone. And that's something that a lot of people actually were pretty stunned to hear. And it kind of rolled, rolled eyes or rolled heads. Um, but I think that that's something which, you know, of course, uh, you absolutely have to do when you're, you're thinking about on the ground, sort of you know, lead by example and, and showcase uh, sort of what it means to be really customer centric. Uh, but again, that model uh, is, is not at all scalable, of course. I mean, so, you know, and you, you hear, you probably read it in the papers that you know, Sachin and Bini Bansal, like during Diwali, right, like they were on the phone talking to customers. They delivered gifts during Diwali. Um, I mean, that's obviously a PR stunt, but, you know, that these guys, I mean, to their credit, Flipkart has been a pioneer in India, I think probably the pioneer in terms of delivering customer experience and really kind of raising the bar, you know, raising the bar for guys like us and for everyone else to, to think about how we treat, how we engage how we deliver to customers day in, day out. And I think you know, that's obviously now percolated down to almost every industry. I mean, you see it, you know, almost all of the, the mobile app commerce players, uh, this is something which is big. But again, to the, to the larger point here, when you're, when you're at that early, early stage, yeah, of course, it's easy. Yeah, I, I could do it. Yeah, Sachin and Bini can do that. But as you grow and as you evolve, uh, you, this definitely has to change. Right? I mean, so systems, processes, technology. And so the, the key piece, I think that's the enabler here is technology. And, and so that's why I wanted to spend a little bit more time talking about because, you know, again, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples for us. Because for us, really, you want to think about sort of from a business process perspective and you, know, you have certain business objectives that you, know, you think you, you know that you want to be able to push out there because you know they'll be extremely beneficial to the customer. And so for us, again, our example is that, you know, well, what do I want to do? I mean, I want to make the, the transaction for booking a self-drive car rental you know, by the hour, by the day. What I want to do is I want to make it super, super easy, super convenient, super flexible, so that I can you know, make a booking in you know, 15 seconds. Uh, I can actually you know, have a car either delivered to my house, uh, or I can uh, go to a pickup point and, and pick it up conveniently. You know, go spend two, three minutes there, you know, just look to a check over once in the car, go in, then go drive around, you know, come back, however many hours, however many days later, you again, two, three minutes, hand back the car very simply, cleanly, just kind of go off. And you know, that, in a nutshell, is like for us, that, that's about you know, how simple, clean, easy, convenient you want to make something for the customer. But you know, for us also, there's so much that goes back into the, sort of the back end of that to deliver this stellar customer experience. And so we're thinking for us, it's about keeping the car really clean. It's about you know, having the car in really, really stellar condition, having the delivery uh, whether it's to their house or whether they pick up, having that in a, in a very seamless fashion where they know how to get to the site, they can get there on time. So all these different elements. So there's a, there's a lot of logistical complexity to it, uh, but it's about so how you can think about really un understanding where things can break and, and trying to really infuse technology in that where you can create sort of automation, which is a really, really important point. Uh, so you can automate certain systems, certain processes where you, again, the, the whole the business objective here is to make it easy, convenient, flexible for the customer. So what we like to do, and we always say, you know, a, a machine can do you know, some sort of work much, much, much better than a human. Uh, so there's certain things that you just shouldn't have. And so for us, one piece where we've been able to, to do some, I think some pretty nice work is, is around actually getting in and out of a car. So we've actually uh, architected a solution, so hardware comes software piece where uh, we actually can you, know, you have this black box that's in the car itself. Uh, it speaks to the cloud, and you know, so three-way communication then back to our servers, our side uh, of, of, the, of the business there. And it, it's pretty simple because the customer actually can pull out his phone, uh, his, his iPhone, his Android phone, and uh, just with a simple tap, either through the app itself or through SMS, can actually go and unlock the car. Uh, so he can unlock the car, start his booking uh, there just very simply, very cleanly, uh, without having an intervention. Uh, that's something where, similarly, when you go back, you, you bring the car, you know, say you, you go outside the city, you come back, uh, you want to drop off the car, again, pull out your phone, simple process, either drop an SMS or simple tap on the app itself, and, and there it is. So that removes the need to have unnecessary friction where you have like a 20-minute, a 30-minute physical enabler. And that's just one example for us, but I would, I would sort of urge all you guys or you know, any, anyone really for that matter who's, who's looking at any sort of business that has some operational element to it, you know, think really, really hard about that process. So understand it extremely well from your perspective. Understand it really even better from the customer's perspective. And really, you know, figuring out just 
go on a whiteboard, figure you know what are the five main customer pain points, and you know really so think okay for me it was okay I want to you know, I'm thinking about customers' time, and for us when when you're thinking I think this is a, a large mega trend, but customers people value time so much more today than they did five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. This is not just a trend in India. I think it's a trend globally. But I think particularly here in India, since I, I moved here three and a half years ago, in, in some ways, you know, Bangalore, Hyderabad, uh, but it, it oftentimes feels like a totally different place because mobile has actually come, and it sounds cliched, but I mean, just think about it in your own lives, right? Like, how many people were just like addicted to their apps three and a half years ago? Uh, it, it didn't really exist. I mean, it was something. It, it's it's hard to believe, but even you know, services that we take for granted, again, like like Ola, like Uber, uh, those weren't around in, in 2012, 2013, really. I mean, it was really just the second half of 2013 when that really started to pick off, uh, take off. So, yeah, I think it, it just goes to show that this is an incredible sea change. And you know, now customers, since there's so many of these different startups that have come into this space uh, that, again, are talking about sort of valuing customers' time, thinking about saving time, thinking about efficiency for the customer, thinking about taking sort of offline processes, making them more online. So I think it's really, really important to stress when you're thinking about the business at scale to, to really understand Again, where in your business process, where in that customer experience uh, can you think about infusing technology, push forward on automation, and, and de deliver this amazing customer experience? Because, again, it goes back to the second point where you, know, you will have to disrupt yourself organizationally. From a structural perspective, again, what works at that level, uh, I really don't think it's going to necessarily work to deliver that amazing customer experience at that higher level. And so along those lines, uh, another thing that's really, really important that dovetails and is tied to this is is measurement and, and sort of the data, and you know we have some of our uh, some of our guys here from the from the team in, in Hyderabad, uh, and and so you know they you know, especially on the operations side. So day in day out, you know you need and again irrespective of your business, but especially if you have an operations focused business, you need to be consistently all the time measuring customer satisfaction. So CSAT, uh, your Net Promoter Score, MPS, uh, which are really really very valuable tools to help you understand. Is your customer really happy? Is he satisfied with the product? Because at the end of the day, uh, no matter if you're really in any consumer-facing business, it's all about your customers and your repeat customer base. Because you know, for us, for Zoom, about half of our customers have actually already used our service. And you know, for a lot of the e-commerce players, it becomes very, very similar. Uh, it can be even higher uh, for some of the, the shopping sites. Uh, but ultimately, as you know, I mean, so that's half our business. I mean, that's our bread and butter. And if we have all these repeat customers, they're only going to repeat and come back if you can deliver them an amazing experience. Because again, I think as, as we all know, you know, India is the most competitive landscape, most hyper-competitive landscape in the world for every business. And that goes without saying, I mean, obviously, offline and online, right? Like how many thousands of little small corona shops there are, but there, you know, there's so many small mom and pop shops, but there's so many other alternatives, like even for our business, if you think about it, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a couple of other organized players in the sort of self-drive rental space. We happen to be the largest, uh, but you know, there are small players that are organized. There's a lot of unorganized sort of tours and travels operators. There's a lot of other options. Like in our instance, our example is, uh, well, you know, again, how many of you, a lot of people have friends, have, have cousins, brothers, whomever, uh, who may own a car. You can maybe borrow a car. So you know, there, there's other, all, the point is there's other alternatives. And India, more than any other country I think that I've ever been in, there's even that many more alternatives. And so, because of that, you better be damn sure that what you're doing and what you're building uh, is, is really world class from a, a customer angle. So, you know, I think that is, uh, is, is one of the, the major, major points. And you know, for us, I, I can just talk a little bit sort of more, you know, those are the three main highlights, but uh, I'll just talk a little bit more sort of about the, the vision for, for us, but really with sort of the you know, vision going forward and sort of where I see sort of the, the technology space going, within the transport space going. Uh, you know, I, I think. What we've seen, again, really over the last year, uh, we've, we've seen probably more change, more innovation over the past 12 months uh, than, than we have over the last 12 years in, uh, in many instances. But you know, as, as we come up here, just to highlight, and, and I think a lot of you guys in the news recently have seen, and in fact, I was in Delhi earlier this week, but you guys have probably seen the, the big news around the whole even-odd number plate and, and the whole ruling around diesel vehicles uh, in terms of registration bans. Now, I, I think this is a really, really important point uh, and not, not to drift too much on a, on a policy deviation, but you know, I think it's, it's something which you know, I think as, uh, you know, as, as concerned citizens, I think everyone is probably pretty excited to see some of the movement on, on the part of the government and the part of a lot of these sort of civic bodies to push this through because it has the potential 
you know, while it's certainly very imperfect at the time, it has the potential to, to really push things in the right direction as it relates to sort of sustainable development and thinking about sort of infrastructure that can work and, and be built to scale for, for taking in the additional 100 million people that be coming into the big cities here over the next five years. So I think that's something which you know, I think you're thinking as a, as a business, well, you know, how do we position ourselves? How do you sort of position yourself uh, to really be able to take advantage uh, of, of these opportunities that you know, the government may put before you and you know, really may come up as it, as it relates to the thing about the, the macro uh, environment. And I, I think for, for us, uh, we, we can look out because uh, this is something that in, in Europe, in, in China, in the U.S., uh, we, there's been a, a lot of sort of path-breaking work that has been pushed out by the government. And what ends up happening is you, you sort of see uh, an ecosystem sort of form around that. So you know, I think what, one thing that you often see is like with electric vehicles, for instance, the government comes in, uh, gives sort of a, a subsidy, something along those lines, uh, you, you'll have you know, many, you know, 10, 15, 20 uh, other companies kind of emerge, kind of coming up around that. Uh, you know, but, I, but I think for, for us right now, today, especially with this ruling, uh, I, I think what's really exciting is that it, it gives really an opportunity and it really sort of necessitates and helps foster the idea of innovation. And so you know, you, you've seen a lot of uh, innovations sort of really flourishing as it relates to sort of ride sharing, carpooling, uh, a lot of these other models where, again, you're thinking about sort of scarcity, you're thinking about resources, how you can club them together in a, in a very, very effective way. Uh, and I think that's something where oftentimes you know, the, the government will, will, will push these things and, and rulings will come up and then you'll see, again, startups kind of mushroom up around that. But so I, I would just sort of you know, close by thinking about and, and sort of say that, well, when, when you think about sort of in, innovation and, and when you're thinking about the opportunities that come up uh, and, and arise, uh, around you, uh, really, you know, think think about those sort of those wedge areas, and think about those gaps uh, in general, where you know there's really a lot of a lot of customer pain. Um, so you think about where you know our opportunities exist, wh whether it's you know something where it's very much driven by offline processes, let's say, uh, whether it's driven by some some huge inefficiency uh, that that you see, and something that really, um, of course, really annoys you or annoys someone who's very, very close and, and around you. Because I think that uh, ultimately, you know, then you know what you're trying to tackle. You have a sense, you, you have a real core understanding that what you're trying to do, what you're trying to build, what you're trying to fix uh, it is, is worth doing in the first place. It's, it's really, really impactful. And I think that's something that, you know, again, tying it back to the very beginning of the discussion, when, when we started ZoomCar, when we thought about, okay, self-drive car rental, you know, it, that was really what it was, right? I mean, it was, it was about you know, kind of wedging in, thinking about those inefficiencies, you know, thinking about where something is, is broken, is not working, or is not getting done, and, and trying to create, again, a very, very customer-centric, very customer-focused solution that ultimately is, is going to uh, drive a, a really transformative impact uh, across, you know, hundreds, thousands, hopefully millions of, of people's lives. And, and that's what it was about for us. And I would sort of urge everyone to, to really, as you're thinking in your own ventures uh, going forward, really look at those principles and hopefully that can guide you and help uh, make a large impact. So I think with that, I'll probably wrap up and have some questions. So, thanks. Yeah. I can see plenty of questions. Start here. I have a two questions. Tom. Sure. First, I like, uh, ask about you, like you know when you start, when the first idea you pursue in your mind, and you think like, okay, now I can do some business. Now, mm -hmm. after you know some some initiation you started. Now, when you feel the competition, and when you feel that you know this idea is unique, or this idea is not unique, but it's different, and how to deal with the competition? Yeah. No, number one, and this competition. It's really idea somebody working actually is working on the and you know there's different silos you know mm. somebody's working mm. with the idea is already you know halfway and is it, that idea is half cooked with somebody and you have already you know some you, you reach to some level different how you tackle that kind of a thing number one and number two when you discuss about the three you know three you know, pillars which you have for ideas you know to run the business in your company uh, th those are where when I see it's very fundamental when you deal mm -hmm. with any organization, these kind of ideas remains always. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, you, you be with your, be friend with your employees or be, 
uh, treat them as a one. Like we you know there's a movie called uh, Salesman of the Year. I don't remember Ranbir Kapoor movies. There's the same. He treated everybody is a si- similar person. Though he you know he fall uh, he faced some fallback. So this is the actually idea to run the same business or you know b- b- the the three silos you know making you know everybody one think like and be friendly and is the really idea but it's a fundamental okay sure uh, so maybe just to, to address those points first so i think you maybe misinterpreted a little bit what i was saying so uh, when i was saying sort of the army of one uh, remember i was saying owners not employees so the the point is it's actually very different from what you just said so what really it's about is is creating people having a, an ownership culture having a buy in where people when they go to work every day they should feel like i own 100% of this company they should feel like i'm the ceo of this company as in like i'm empowered to to make sorry so so that that's what so as i'm saying so that is what we have to strive for every single day the way and again this is not easy this is actually the hardest thing you could actually do this is definitely not easy but the point is uh the way you do that is by every rung every step of the way giving these guys the opportunity to drive initiatives and allowing their voice to be heard constantly and actually giving them the power to go out and and implement and you know if they have an idea if they say okay well x you know this is how our operations are actually performing right now and if i say well you know they should we should be tweaking this here uh, and that's going to mean this type of customer experience over here well then you know, you know we should actually give them the the freedom and flexibility and power to actually drive those things and you know have that okay well maybe okay i have a manager i have so maybe a director of a product who's overseeing it but the point is that you have to be willing and and able to to actually go and and action those things and you know i think with startups it's obviously a lot easier than if i were at infosys right but the the point is so many of these companies have unnecessary hierarchies where you don't have that and people come in and they think it's about a, a 9 to 5 job and you know that there's a reason why that you have you know the best companies will have junior people just working for no reason at you know 2 in the morning on a on a Tuesday night right i mean that that's how you you build that sort of culture you you have this burning sensation where people actually want to do that work where they again it goes back to really connecting with the vision if if they know that we're going to be you know disrupting transport if they know that we're going to be again you know helping to really really reduce air pollution and reduce congestion you know they're really motivated by that that's a powerful idea i mean it's like when people think about electric vehicles there's a reason why elon musk is probably the most successful entrepreneur in the world uh in building tesla and building these other companies like solar city and spacex because people just have this unbelievable burning desire to to work for not just for him but for the idea and i think that's that's it's critical yeah okay yeah greg uh, what you have done is mighty impressive but it's also much more impressive that you came in from the us and did here india is a difficult place to work in <laughs> it is and uh, we uh, i i find it quite uh, uh, perplexing that you could uh, actually make this happen as an american here <laughs> what were the big challenges that you faced sure while yeah. uh, traveling these last two years or three years of uh, sure. of work so i'd say it's yeah not not a difficult place to work um but yeah i mean <laughs> what what i would say i think one really important point though uh is and i didn't really touch on it much in the talk you know we've actually been incredibly you know, fortunate i mean to have have partners and guys like Bashir uh but we have people like that in every single city and i think you know having strong partners who you you work with and whether whether they're on the automotive side whether it's in the real estate side uh whether it's with a sort of large restaurant group let's say um you know whether it's you know someone who is uh, helping facilitate parking and siting where you work with closely so in our business there's there's obviously any n number of those different verticals that we work closely with and you know the the one big big challenge is when i was coming into bangalore when you, know, you had a couple of you know local guys who were helping on some operational points but having really strong business partners in those initial cities for us i mean it was it was tricky to find them uh but you know you have to keep you know going to different events you know, meeting people who will introduce you to friends and friends and friends and i think it's really about more than anything else sort of being tenacious and sort of understanding sort of the intricacies and the complexities of uh sort of the indian business ecosystem and and really understanding sort of like the, the connections and the layers like who's connected to who so where because in in some cases it's actually helpful to go on whiteboard and just sort of 
think about sort of the, the relationship ecosystem and sort of see where uh, people can be sort of useful and helpful in, in your venture in, in terms of guidance. I think that was really important, but yeah, no doubt that the government, as I sketched out that story early on, that was a huge, huge challenge that we faced early on for the first six months. And really only after that were we able to kind of take a sigh uh, and have a really breath of relief and understand that, yeah, we could go and operate. But now it's interesting because as we evolve, those changes and those challenges actually become very different. So early on, yeah, raising money, it was, it was very challenging. It was hard, right? So that was tough. And you know, really, you have to keep proving your business, keep proving out the customers, keep showing all those repeat customers come back. So you know, sort of funding and hiring uh, were really enormous challenges. So hiring, especially actually, I mean, you might think maybe it's an advantage. It could be a disadvantage being an American uh, doing the business here. But the reality is a lot of people early on were very, very skeptical, had a lot of doubts around the, the business, around my commitment, my dedication. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, you're American, like, you won't be able to handle, and yet you can't handle the food, you know, the climate. Uh, so people say you'll, you'll go back home in like six months, one year. So a lot of, a lot of guys, uh, again, smart guys who are engineers or whomever, you know, they, you know, for rightly or for wrongly, they, they had doubts uh, about kind of joining up. And I think, again, the only way to sort of silence those doubts uh, is, is time and, and kind of the, the traction and the success of the business. So you, know, you just have to keep building up that story. And it's to what I was saying earlier. You know, it's about projecting that, that vision and that mission, sort of, well, this is why we're here, this is why we exist. It's always about starting with why. Uh, 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 Greg here, uh, Professor Kiran. I'm going to probe you a little further about the why aspect of uh, what you've said. Sure. The locus of action in the automobile industry shifting from Detroit, Michigan, to Silicon Valley. You have the Google cars and... Right. Hyperloop, uh, you've, you've uh, alluded to uh, yeah. Elon Musk. Uh, Two-fold question. The first one is, you could so easily have started your venture in Silicon Valley as opposed to starting it in Bangalore with all its chaos and uh, uh, what do you call it? The second aspect is, uh, as a business school teacher, as a professor, uh, one of the mantras that I share with my uh, wannabe entrepreneurial students is that while persistence is important, letting go of the past is equally important. I give them the, uh, the example right. of Steve Jobs, who's right. kicked out of Apple by John Scully, comes back after 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, he came back only because he was able to let go of the past and the bitterness. Right. The question A is why Bangalore, uh, India? Mm -hmm. And the second uh, uh, part of the question is, when does an uh, entrepreneur take a call as to thus far no further? As far mm -hmm. as, as, far as, as, uh, sorry, as far as his venture is concerned. Yeah. yeah. OK. Sure. So, so yeah, just to the first point of that, so why Bangalore? Uh, well, yeah, I think for us, actually, to the first point, though, it's something that we really couldn't have done, actually, in Silicon Valley, because really, this type of business, so the, the nature, the idea of self-drive car rental, had been done in several different iterations in the US. Uh, so if you look at Zipcar, you look at Hertz, Avis Enterprise, all of these guys, car to go. So those five guys have a very, very dominant market share. They're doing what we're doing, and we have really taken this model, turned it on its head, and adopted a lot of sort of very customized, localized products. So the idea of delivering a car to a doorstep uh, really had never been done anywhere outside of India. I mean, we're the first ones to do this really globally. Uh, so that, that's an innovation that was really born and brought up in the Indian market, now allowing flexible one-way uh, drops over time here, too. That, again, those are Indian innovations, or innovations that we brought here in India. But you know, it was something where, I, again, I thought this was a huge white space. And as you know, as a, as a professor there, when you're looking at having a first mover advantage is, is huge. And when you're in an ocean of opportunity sitting where, if I look at the largest company in China doing this today, it's a $5.5 billion market cap. It's a, and we always talk about it with the, the team here. You know, it's a company that has 1 lakh cars. 1 lakh cars. The Chinese market is 1.8 lakhs for the top three players. Cars. We, there's in the market here, it's just over 3,000. So I mean, that's astonishing to think how much the early days we are in this rental market. If you look at pure numbers, so China does about 7 to 8x the number in, in terms of volume uh, that, that we do in terms of sales as, as India uh, on a country level. So the fact that there's such a wide disparity between rental uh, for us was all we needed to really hear. And to the second point, though, and, and so just to say with Bangalore, you know, why Bangalore and not, say Delhi, Bangalore is a market, as you know, I mean, it's certainly the, the innovation hub of India. It certainly has the largest IT crowd largest sort of nomadic population but people not from Bangalore. I think like probably 75% of our customers are North Indian in Bangalore. Um, but you know, it's, it's a market where people are certainly very, very flexible, very sort of 
you know, forward thinking, and there's a lot of outstation trips, and there's a lot of chaos in the city. And the chaos is good because it means that people don't want to own a car. They don't want to. No one. If you talk to, I don't know how many of you guys are from Bangalore, but if you know, thinking about Bangalore, no one wants to drive a car every single day in Bangalore. I'm sorry, no one wants to do it. It's it's a chaos. I mean, people are complaining. I heard about complaints about the traffic in Hyderabad tonight. I mean, this is like 2 a.m. in Bangalore, so um, it's not not so bad. Um, so I think that actually bodes well for our business. So the second point, which is actually a much tougher question, I think that there's honestly no good answer there. I, I think really when when you think about sort of when is it really just sort of when to call it quit, so to speak? You know, I, I think really for us, I mean, I was about two days away from calling it quits. I mean, because if we couldn't, we'd raise money. I was I was about to hand. I had an email written to hand the money back to our investors in 2012 because you know there was really and at that point, thankfully, we hadn't spent too much of it, but. Uh, you know, there was nothing we could have done. If we couldn't start, if we didn't have the legal permissions to start the business, then you know, you, what are you going to do? Because uh, I didn't want to go to jail. I was in a new country. I didn't want to do something where I would be locked in a, in a Bangalore prison for five years. That was not, not the ideal. Um, but what, what really you think about, you know, I think when you're fast forwarding and actually say you start your business, you know, I think you obviously want to, to iterate and, and keep pivoting and keep pivoting to the point where, not that you're out of pivot, so to speak, but you realize that you know, there's just no product market fit. I think you know you obviously that's the number one thing you're always thinking is is what I'm sort of basically offering my service, my product. Is it being used by customers? Is there real value there? And you know it, this is an iterative process, so there's no way where you can say like I can't quantify that necessarily. But you know, you'll pivot probably say three or four times, and if you realize that there's just not that fit, and you you can't scale, scale that and grow a customer base, well then you're probably just going to move on. Yeah. Uh, like everyone, I have two questions. <laughs> First question is, uh, like you said, uh, transformation of the operational activities uh, using the technological um, advance, advancement that is very important for uh, any business. Sure. Since you are from finance background, uh, we want to know uh, to what extent uh, you know uh, you can rely on any person. If you want to take support of any engineer, if you want to hire an engineer then how do you ensure that this is the best engineer? Or if you want to take support of uh, any other consulting firm just specialized in this, so how do you ensure that uh, the product which they develop is, you know, uh, uh, the best pro uh, best app or maybe the best website or whatever thing we use in the technical process? Mm -hmm. That was my first question. Second question is not specific to uh, Zoom car. Uh, there are a lot of startups which are uh, coming up in India. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are giving a lot of uh, uh, referral bonus, discounts, and a uh, lot of private equity funds are being used for discounts uh, and v v various other things. Mm -hmm. So, is this another uh, financial bubble coming up in India, like which has happened in uh, uh, US, in uh, which we call dot com uh, right, right. Uh, bubble? Yeah. 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 <laughs> So those are yeah that's a that's a tough one but I would say look I mean whether whether it's a bubble or whether it's not a bubble is really irrelevant right because the reality is a lot of great companies are getting built today and you know there are a lot of companies that aren't great that are getting built today and whether you're in a bubble whether you're not in a bubble it just means that when you're in a bubble a lot of the companies that are not great that are getting built uh, are ultimately going to get funding and they're going to crash and burn but yeah reality okay 90% of these companies are going to fail and they are going to go under but the point is. You know, if, I, if I look back and you, you mentioned the example of the, the, the first tech bubble in the U.S., and but you know, coming out of that, well, you know what company was built? Google. I mean, Google came out directly out of that. You know, Facebook came out directly out of that. You know, two of the most successful companies in the world today. Um, so the point is, and you, know, you have companies that are, yes, raising money today in India at insane valuations, very, very high valuations. And many of them have course corrected. And you've seen a lot of, even in the last three, four months, there has been a lot of carnage in certain spaces, like in food tech, uh, some of the logistics players. And, and you'll, you'll see more and more of these companies will ultimately fail. But the point is, you know, the, there are going to be one, two, three companies emerging out of these different sectors that, that are going to, to work and make a lot of sense. So I, I think you know, and this is something you saw in the US probably two, two, three years ago, and now India is sort of caught up on that. But I think what's a really uh, more important point than so whether it's a bubble or not is actually when you think about the mentality and the, the mind shift and that transformation. So if I go if I go down the road here to ISB or if I go uh, to IIIT or if I go to you know, IIT Delhi or any any of the top schools, whether it's engineering or business schools, now if you go in and you, you talk the halls, 
you talk to professors, um, you know, you'll, you'll hear that so many people now today, and not this was not the case even when I came to India three years ago, so many people today want to go and work in a startup. And I think that is really, really exciting. And that this is something where India was, was definitely lagging the uh, U.S. and China a little bit in this mentality. But that's now changed in the last 12 months, 18 months. And I see it because, you know, we've recruited all these ITs and these you know, top business schools. And so we, we definitely see that mentality shift. And it's, it's so much easier to get the best cream of the cream to come work for you. And I think that's really, really exciting. So that, that's the point there. To your first question, uh, so I, I think it was maybe more along the lines of, well, how can I, uh, some, someone from a finance background, sort of assess sort of tech talent or product talent? Or, so, yeah, I think, you know, it's obviously, again, I've, I've certainly learned a lot, and I have a lot still to learn in my role. Uh, but that's something where, I, to be honest, I didn't know anything about technology in 2012 when I came in and started this business. I, I knew uh, probably a decent amount about finance and about you know, doing deals and transactions and operations, but definitely did not know a thing about technology, certainly did not know a thing about mobile. Uh, you know, on, on one level, I, I, was, I was actually teaching myself how to code, uh, doing, doing online courses, and, and that, that actually helped a little bit. But then, you know, I just talking to so many people, so many friends uh, who were working in this space in the U.S. and India, uh, that certainly helped, but I think you, you need to, as I was mentioning with one of the earlier questions, uh, you know, where you have a, a strong local business champion uh, in different cities, you need to have a couple of you know, sort of strong third party sort of technical champions, so to speak, people who you can lean on uh, and really trust. And, and that's ultimately how we hired our CTO was that way, uh, and that was great. And then over time, you know, once you uh, take in funding, uh, and this is another place where you can take some strategic investors, and oftentimes investors can really help. Uh, and not even just like the Sequoias of the world, the venture capital funds. I mean, obviously they can help with referrals and, and screening people, and, and they do a nice job there. But I think a lot of the, some of the, the powerful angel investors, particularly in India, and you know, look, I mean, if you look as an example, the, the Bonsels for Flipkart, um, you know, Canal, Snapdeal, all these guys, they do a lot of angel investing, right? They do a lot of seed investing on their own. Uh, and you know, it's, it's exciting to tap their minds because a lot of these guys, as you think, come up in your venture, that they can also add a lot of value. And in fact, that did happen for us with some of our angel investors who, uh, who were able to help out there too. Hi, Greg. Uh, my name is Surya. Thanks for uh, articulating the journey of ZoomCard so well. Uh, I have only one question. Uh, <laughs> my question is like, what is your typical customer profile? Because I can understand self-driven car works very well in US because you have a fantastic infrastructure. But here, with this kind of traffic problems and parking issues, I would like to prefer somebody drive a car for me rather than me driving. So what is your uh, typical customer profile? Thank right, you. Right, right, right. So that, that's a tough one to tackle. In fact, I was actually talking about this earlier tonight uh, with some of the guys. But you know, it, it, to be candid, to be honest, there's really no typical customer profile. Uh, because it really, and, and this is really, you can build this up about a lot of different businesses. It's when you, whenever you think about consumer businesses, and particularly our business, and I said to the, the guys, the Hyderabad team here, is it's all about use cases and it's all about sort of building up those different ideas and those use cases, those reasons for using the service. And so, you know, as an example, just a couple. Uh, so, you know, during a weekday, for instance, say it's a, a Tuesday, right? Say I'm, I'm coming into Hyderabad from, from Bangalore. I'm here for a day, two days. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense for me to pick up a car from the Hyderabad airport, from, from GMR, and, uh, and then roam around the city. I have a lot of different meetings. That's going to be, A, it's going to be cheaper than a taxi or a chauffeur service. Uh, 30 to 40 percent cheaper. B, it'll be more convenient and flexible because I'll have that uh, comfort of just being able to kind of go off when I want. And you know, and then C, I'm, I'm usually going to be okay at a hotel or a different corporate, so you know, parking is no issue. So, so that, that's one really, really big use case where you have you know, people you know, coming in during the week uh, for for business purposes, but you also have you know, very, very strong uh, you know folks who are you know, if I think about university students over at you know, ISB or IIT or, or wherever it may be, uh, you know, and during a weeknight. Uh, you want to go out for four or five hours with a large group of people. Uh, you want to go and take a car, uh, take an SUV where you can fit everyone into one car, have that common experience. Uh, that, that's actually a huge advantage. Uh, Think about, you know, you can take a Merc, go out on a date with my girlfriend, go, go wherever. Uh, so impress her as if this is my own car. Uh, so the, that's, that's something which uh, certainly it's a, it's a powerful use case. It's, it's even more powerful in Delhi and Chandigarh, right, because of the, uh, the mentality, I'd say. But, <coughs> you know, Hyderabad, too, I think it works well. So, uh, but then on the weekends, then the, the obvious case is, you know, folks are going out of station. Uh, if people, now, now Hyderabad probably doesn't have as many destinations that are like two, three hours away, like, uh, like Bangalore, or Pune, or Bombay. But, you know, people here, they still roam all the way to Goa. Maybe I'll go to uh, the coast uh, on the east side. I'll go to Vijayawada. I'll go. So there's a lot of different spots that you can go and, and get out of the, the chaos, uh, the mini, I'd say mini chaos of Hyderabad. 
uh, on, on the weekends. And so you know, we have it really ranges. I mean, 18 to 35 is, is definitely a sweet spot. I mean, certainly the, the salaried professionals for us in the 20s, that's obviously you know, a great, great, great business group. But we've been seeing more and more people who are you know, 35, 40, 50 plus taking the car and uh, going with their families. Uh, you know, when people, and, and the beauty, and this is actually one of the best things, whenever I talk to American investors, I always say one of the best things about India is that the families are very large. And so it really works, and the extended families, right? So uh, a lot of cousins, cousin brothers, and so that's actually great. Because then that means, you know, if I have two cars, if I have, but I have five adults, six adults, well, that's a real dilemma, right? I'm not going to, why are you going to go and buy five cars? I mean, so sorry, five cars, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so as long as you buy four cars. But yeah, yeah. So I, I think that that's really, in a nutshell, why you know a lot of el more you know, elderly people and you know, more people who you know, again have large families already, uh, kids, even grandkids, uh, would, would actually use the service. Yeah. 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 Uh, how do you make sure that uh, the customers don't damage your cars? Because I have a four-wheeler license, but I don't know how to drive. <laughs> uh, a lot, I mean, lot of you out there. Yeah, right? two more questions yeah. I have. Uh, <laughs> but you admitted it, so yeah. Some yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think uh, yeah, it's certainly something that, yeah, obviously not all of our customers are amazing drivers. Uh, it's Unfortunately, it's a little challenging. You can't screen driver quality uh, in advance. And this is something, actually, I've been pushing the government on this whenever I've spoken to people like in the transport ministry, et cetera. We need to have a more robust system across states of sharing. So like an example is in, some of you guys have probably been to the states, uh, been to the U.S., and you've seen or heard from friends or relatives that you know, we have a system in the U.S. where uh, you know, if I'm, I'm from New York, right, so, but if I were in California, and I, when I was driving California when I was in business school, people, they would actually exchange records, the DMVs, so the RTO, the DMV is the equivalent of the RTO in the U.S., so they would know, so basically if a, if a cop, if a police guy pulled me over in L.A., you know, he would be able to access and see my records, and so, but then car rental companies could also access records, and so that sort of online DB, the database of sharing, uh, was pretty powerful, and uh, that's something which, unfortunately, is not available. So, you know, if I have a guy who's from Bihar, from West Bengal, uh, who's in Bangalore, like, or Hyderabad, you know, I'm stuck. Like, I don't know what he's actually done. Now, that said, uh, that's not the end of the world because insurance is there. So we have very strong insurance partners, both in the private sector and public sector. So, you know, these guys have been very instrumental. And we've been able to, to go ahead and do a lot of path-breaking stuff on the insurance side to ensure that we're covered in these different capacities. Now, we also uh, do a lot of uh, investment on our own on, on some hardware and some technology that can monitor and track so we have a system that can track real-time driving behavior, uh, which can give us a lot of insight into how the customer is performing. Uh, and then that ultimately is data that we use to, you know, we can incentivize and we can have sort of, you know, you know carrot stick approach, which are ways that you can kind of, you know, slowly nudge people into some better driving behavior. So a combination of really different things. One question per person hereafter. I mean, there are too okay. many people waiting. <laughs> so we'll not allow more than one question. After this lady, it will come to you. Um, let me first compliment you on uh, uh, your amazing understanding of this country in such a short time, the complexities. The just, complex just started, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, see, uh, the, when, a, when a company like yours which has started in the U.S. in a completely different culture from India and you're scaling up, um, usually it tends to centralize its process, uh, processes because it becomes process-driven. <laughs> Right. Uh, processes for them to be effective have to be culturally rooted too. Hmm. So how do you balance this uh, need to centralize, uh, centrally des design a process, yet make it culturally rooted? How did you handle that? And specifically within that, the attitudes of the human resources, because that's the key thing in a customer interface. Hmm. How do you deal with them? Because you may have a ready-made attitude in, culturally in the U.S., but here maybe you have to um, train them. How do you manage that? So, yeah, yeah. that... <laughs> That's very fair. That's a very astute observation, I would say. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the point, so our, we're based in Bangalore, right? So our HO, our corporate team is in Bangalore. Uh, so 100%, so I'm actually the only non-Indian in the entire company. So 100% Indian uh, in terms of our employee base, uh, aside from myself. And it, it's something, though, in Bangalore, that was our first city for the first uh, roughly uh, 15 months, uh, 15 and a half, 16 months. And for us, uh, we really, it was, it was quite easy to control things just being in one city. As soon as we actually started to, to multiply and go out to two, three, five, seven cities, uh, then you, know, you really have to, to think about really having a very strong localized team in each place. Because the reality is, yeah, so Hyderabad is different from Bangalore. Uh, Delhi is very different from Bangalore. Chennai is quite different from Mumbai. Um, so you, know, you, you want to have 
a uh, strong presence of you know three or four guys. And that's we we like to kind of keep it to that sort of level of around three or four um, you know strong business guys in each in each location who can kind of run with an entire region and sort of understand sort of the the hyper local culture and the so the nuances the the preference. So I think what the one rule that we like to follow again this is a rough guiding post. Nothing is concrete, but you know, around sort of like the 80-20, where it's like 80 percent will be sort of standardized from the corporate side and from Bangalore, and so you know, pushing that down across cities. And then around 20 percent will be sort of uh, customizable, flexible. Where I'll say, okay, yeah, in Hyderabad we want to do things a little bit like X, as opposed to like Y in uh, in Bangalore. And you know, examples in uh, in Hyderabad would be you know certainly you know thinking about uh, you know we'll, we really we focus and, and build a, a lot of sort of uh, in, around the city use cases uh, where because we again we know that uh, we're not going to necessarily see as many po folks going very far out of the city, out of station during the weekday. Uh, so we really kind of focus and customize our, our use case marketing building uh, very differently in Hyderabad. Uh, but then now what I'll, what I'll say is to your second point uh, on the HR side of things. Well, again, the whole company being here in India, but uh, the HR team we we really focus a lot on sort of uh, employee sort of empathy building and sort of training. Uh, so the, the training. Particularly on the, the call center, so I think what your comment was particularly relevant for the, the customer care teams, uh, and so you know there there has to be significant soft skill and hard skill training. So in the, in the U.S., I think uh, the one place where the U.S. is probably still a lot stronger than India is around soft skill training and soft skills for uh, people who are of the sort of the lower income brackets. Uh, I think that's whether it's for a call center executive or a fleet executive who's on the ground with the vehicle. You know, part of it's education, but part of it is is sort of just the training and sort of the background. Of the folks, and you know, I think because of that, you know, we take a lot of great care. And our team here in Hyderabad does a great job on this, as well as uh, thinking about sort of the, that empathy side of it, internalizing. But we have internal and external facing training, so we actually have a third party that comes in. We design a curriculum and a program. We do a lot of gamification around that because what we realize is that guys who are at that level, uh, who may not have the best educational background, uh, but of course these guys are very hungry, very passionate, very motivated to to earn well and, and do well and, and move up. Uh, in society, which is, you know, of course, very admirable, and you know, I think, but what's really important for those guys is is finding that connection, and you know, I, I think we've always been able to do that, I think, decently well in the sense that we've been able to to push with these, some of these third-party trainers, as well as designing our own curriculum for both hard skill empowerment and sort of soft skill training. And one one final example on the hard skill, we were actually doing this today in Bangalore. We're doing an Excel, Microsoft Excel training for our fleet executives, and so th these are guys who are. Again, they're earning a much more modest salary, uh, sort of more on a monthly basis, where they're with the with the cars, kind of cleaning the cars, maintaining the cars, fueling the cars, um, sort of doing a lot of the on-ground last-mile ops. But now, you know, empowering them, giving them some skill, additional skills uh, like the Microsoft Excel training, I think is very, very helpful because it, it helps you know, both from their employee morale standpoint, and then it also translates into sort of better customer engagement, customer experience, uh, because these guys are you know, just a better knowledge base, more motivated. So those are just a couple of examples. So, uh, have you ever considered having two wheelers like scooters or motorcycles in the this thing? Because India is essentially a two wheeler country. Yeah, it is. That's that's certainly a very interesting point. You know, now what I'll say though is just to stop you because if you say it's a two wheeler country, uh, you know, yes, it, it is, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the best two wheeler rental country, right? Because a lot of people own two wheelers. So if you look at across the tier one cities, uh, typically you have you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 percent car ownership uh, in terms of per household. 15 to 20 percent of households will own a car. Now, in the tier one cities in India, uh, you're close to 45 to 50 percent uh, for two wheeler ownership across households. So inherently, there you have to think about the use cases very differently. We have thought about this for for some time. I think the, look, the car market is so so darn big in India that we can be doing this for a long time. That said, a lot of the technology that we're doing, a lot of the ops that we're putting in place and building. Is something which can easily be replicated for two wheelers. So it's not, it's definitely not you know, far off or wild imagination to think that you know, we could certainly go and look at executing and doing that. There's a lot of, a uh, lot more regulatory uncertainty around that. Uh, you know, there's certainly some nuances that you would have to think about. Uh, but I, I think there are a couple of companies that have come along and are, are doing some good work there, like Wicked Rides and uh, a few others. But it's still early days for the for the bike side of it. And you, you probably saw recently uh, Baxi and a couple of guys up in Delhi. I've started doing bike taxi operations. Uh, the Delhi government's been pretty progressive, uh, sort of ironically that they're allowing this. But uh, that that's something which will come up too. So I think it's certainly something that we, we could think about in the future, but not right now. So. Hello. Uh, 
ट्वेंटी परसेंट ऑफ दिस कंट्री हैज एक्चुअली एक्सेस टू इंटरनेट आउट ऑफ विच फोर्टीन परसेंट एक्चुअली हैज अ स्मार्टफोन आउट ऑफ विच इफ आई माई टैट टेन परसेंट मे हैव एन इंटरनेट कनेक्शन इन दियर स्मार्टफोन सो डू यू थिंक दैट योर स्ट्रैटेजी ऑफ गोइंग एप ओनली वेर इन अ वेरी फ्यू पीपल और सेक्शन ऑफ दिस कंट्री हैज एक्चुअली एक्सेस टू एन इंटरनेट कनेक्शन ऑन दियर स्मार्टफोन इज अ वाइज स्ट्रैटेजी एंड यू मैंशनड इलॉन मस्क सो आई वुड लाइक यू टू ऑल्सो हैव यू रेड अबाउट पीटर थियल who recently came out with a book called zero to one notes on startups and future he said that competition is a perfect recipe for losers because competition what it does is it actually when many people come into competition the real beneficiary is the customer not the player because the player in order to survive in the competition keeps on giving discount as we are seeing now with uber ola you also i believe so i mean is there a strategy that you have in mind so that you actually create a business which is able to survive for a much longer period of time rather than sure so i'll just address a couple of those points so first i'm not, I'm not sure where you got the idea that we are app only but uh, so we're, that's definitely not the case so we're a website and mobile app so android ios and website so for us you know a majority a majority of our bookings do come from app but we still have a huge percentage of our bookings that come from the traditional desktop Uh, from the actual website, so that's something which yeah, I don't, I definitely don't see a, a future, a near-term future, maybe even a medium-term future where we would ditch that. Well, for us, app only actually doesn't make sense. So we we haven't haven't gone that direction, uh, and I, I agree with that point, and that's one of the reasons why you you want to also have the the desktop. That said, I mean most of our design thinking, most of our product thinking is around the app, right? Because or or even around the mobile website, which we're actually in the midst of revamping, because that's something where You know, just think of how much easier it's. So much easier for people to just pull out their phone, and you know, whether you're on Wi-Fi or you're on 3G, that process. If you have a booking be made anywhere, impulse, whether it's impulse or not impulse, it's just so much better, right? So that's ultimately why we are ultimately a lot more bullish on the app. And you know, to that point, well, we know that also the network connectivity. It's only going to get better right now. Uh, if you look at things like Reliance Geo, uh, if you look at the initiatives that Airtel. What everyone are doing. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm definitely bullish over the next three, four, five years on that front. To so your second point around Peter Thiel, yeah, I know. I certainly read a lot about Peter, but I uh, actually haven't read that particular book. But you know, I think you know, I, I would just say, look, well, who, wh- what is the largest company? Who is the largest company in the world? Who is the richest company in the world? Apple, right? So Apple is by far, if you look at the, they just look at their cash on their balance, uh, 100 billion dollars of cash. They're the most successful company in human history. They also operate in the most competitive market there is. I mean, smartphones, tablets, computers. So, I mean, I, I don't buy that at all. I think that's a rubbish argument. Um, but if you if you look at something though, yeah, every single sector. I, I've never seen you point to me. Tell me one company that doesn't have a competitor. I mean, every single company has a competitor. Now, the best companies certainly when you're you're building them. Uh, you know, ideally, as as I said for us, you know, we didn't have we didn't have a direct competitor for 18 months. And that was a huge advantage. I absolutely agree that that is hugely beneficial. When you're starting a company, it's always better to be the market leader, the market maker. There's no doubt about it. But no company is immune from competition, and to think otherwise is totally ridiculous. Okay. So, um, based on your uh, successful experience here in Bangalore, um, what would you say are the two main strengths uh, that the Indian ecosystem offered? You know, something that is unique and that helped you. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. I think one of the things that was extremely beneficial for us is that, and I think we all know, there's a huge wealth of tremendous technical engineering talent, uh, and that translates not only to engineering, as into like a, a CS guy who's going to be a, a dev, uh, back end dev, front end dev, mobile app guy. Um, it, it also translates into really people who think very well, uh, very structured sort of mechanical thoughts and around uh, thinking. Adopting those engineering practices and thinking about operations in that sort of systematic way—that's uh, something which I think, for me, I think India has a lot more talent and a lot more of those type of folks uh, than the U.S. does. And it, ironically, of course, the, the guys who are really good in the U.S. are actually of Indian origin. Um, but you know, so I, I think it's part of the, so the discipline and the training from an early days standpoint, and that is is really critical because, as I said, you know, our, our business is very very operationally intensive. And to have guys who are on our ops product team and who are operations and who are helping to to run the cities, uh, having that sort of structure and that thought process and that approach uh, is, is valuable. And I say that's one thing. But the, the second thing in in India is the fact that you have a, a a customer base in general that 
you know, is, I think, really, really willing and able to, to really try, try new things. And you know, I think the, the youth here in India have probably even fewer preconceived notions than, than they do in the U.S. Uh, I think part of it is because you have this sort of like this crazy leapfrogging effect where, you know, where I feel like in some ways we're sort of you know, jumping you know, three or four different rungs on the, on the ladder in India. Uh, you know, if you think the, the one common example is the, you know, the desktop computer you know, never took off the laptop never really took off in India because everyone just went to a smartphone. And you, know, you just totally skipped a, a generation, so to speak. I think that mentality is, is actually picking up for a lot of the, the young kids who are in like tier two, tier three cities. Uh, and I think that mentality, that uh, understanding, and that sort of consumer psyche uh, is, is hugely beneficial and actually uh, pretty unique to India. So, yeah. Yeah. so I, I just turned, I'm 30. <laughs> so I, I that's have a serious question for <laughs> Sorry. I've always seen you in your okay. work clothes, which is this green T-shirt. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you're not at work, what do you wear? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm at the gym that I'm wearing uh, shorts, but yeah, yeah. Otherwise, no, I like to. I actually like to wear different T-shirts, so not just Zoom T-shirts, but you know, sometimes I may mix it up with a sport jacket. But yeah. So. <laughs> Sir, are the cars that you rent are owned by company or? <coughs> so some some of the cars are, uh, some some are not. Most of the cars are owned by the company, uh, but you know, one, one thing that, you know, certainly there's a lot of other supply models that are potentially out there. Uh, I think for us right now, there's, there's a lot of legal murkiness uh, to the, some of those models. Uh, that's something where, yeah, I think one, you know, of course people often ask me, well, we actually get these emails, right? So someone will say, I, have, I own two cars. One of the cars, okay, maybe my wife uses, and she only uses it once a week, twice a week. Can I put that car, can I attach that car with you? And we can do like a revenue share. And you know that makes sense for a lot of people. Like intuitively, it's like, yeah, I have this this asset, this like eight lakh asset that's sitting in my driveway. I'm not really using it that much. I'm paying you know 25k a month, 27k a month in fixed costs. That's a waste, right? Like why why do I have to do that? So that that's actually it's a really interesting model. Uh, it's something that unfortunately the government doesn't allow right now today. But there are some other machinations around that model uh, which could potentially take off. I think that that's where uh, it becomes a little compelling because. You can grow. It's a lot easier to grow a fleet in that fashion, which is more crowdsourced, uh, where you can go from you know, 2,000, 5,000 to 1 lakh cars. Uh, whereas if you're just looking at your own balance sheet, you know, maybe you can only get to 20,000 cars or 30,000 cars. So yeah, there, there's a lot of different options that are going to be out there in the future. And second question was, like, uh, someone asked you about two-wheeler. Someone asked you about two-wheeler, and you said two-wheeler mostly people like to own. Yeah. But now a new category of two-wheelers are gaining ground and there are super bikes which everyone cannot afford right. to own. And uh, this is something which people uh, use it more as an aspirational. Right. So are you uh, thinking on? So who's going to use that bike at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday? <laughs> Vikram, one second. Uh, yeah. one, one question. How many here own or run a startup? I just wanted to understand the profile of this audience today. And uh, how many work for it together with that? Yeah. That's a good number. Okay. Good stuff. Carry on. Okay. okay. So I have a question. Like India being the second most fasting, fast developing countries of the world, and the standard of living of the people are growing day by day. So I just yeah. want to know what will be the company's profile down ten years, ten years down the line, or what will you plan after ten years? <laughs> wow. I I probably couldn't even tell you what the profile will be ten months down the line. So. That's, uh, that's pretty, pretty tough. So yeah, I think going out in the crystal ball, like as I said three years ago, uh, I think I was living in a different country. Uh, as in like, India has evolved and changed so much in, in those three years. So particularly Bangalore. I mean, some, some places, I was just in Chandigarh actually uh, earlier this, this week, and I was joking. I was like, I was in Chandigarh in 2011, and it actually looks exactly the same. So it's not every city is like that. Bangalore, Hyderabad is obviously more like Bangalore uh, in that sense. But no, I think, I think there's certainly... Uh, a lot of different directions and paths that this could go, but I, I think it, it's certainly something that we want to, to be in a position where you know, we'll certainly surpass one lakh cars uh, on the road and, and be across you know, 50 plus cities for sure uh, at that time frame. But you know, and certainly, I think we can do that a lot sooner than 10 years. Yes. So, um, uh, a, do, do you consider yourself as a born-in-the-cloud, uh, very technology-centric company or an infrastructure player um, that's in the cars business? Uh, that, that
the the side of the story why I'm asking this is um, we live in a country where uh, uh, connectivity is not a given. Um, and when you are looking at assets that are 8 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 30 lakhs, 50 lakhs, um, it's not very easy to track them. L literally, you could lose cars. So what, what are the measures? I mean, obviously you have your box and all that. But um, um, do, you, do you see that security itself, um, how, how important is it for a born in the cloud company? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think certainly we, we have a lot of more sophistication, a lot more technology than just the, so the box itself. I mean, so it's ultimately the software that powers that box, right? It's about the algorithms that you have, about the alerts, the, the different mechanisms that you have in your back end and your CRM system, which can give you that sort of real-time visualization and ability to understand where your assets are, uh, at what point, uh, when, where, and so how. I mean, those are the questions that uh, we, our team, so we have a dedicated team that is monitoring and tracking that 24-7. Uh, thankfully, touch, touch wood, we, we haven't had one of those, uh, one of those issues uh, thus far. But you know, I think you, you always need to, to prepare yourself. I, mean, I think, as I mentioned with one of the earlier questions, insurance, if you're thinking about just tracking of vehicles, I mean, in, insurance is obviously there, which can provide some mitigation uh, in, in certain instances. But again, it, it's not, I actually don't view that as really a, a real Problem. I think that the larger technology challenge is is really thinking about building a an inventory system which can be flexible and scale so to meet the customer requirements. I think that's actually more even more critical. Hi, for insurance. Hi here. Oh. Here. Oh, sorry. Yep. For insurance uh, compliance, what are the technologies you've deployed? Do you have onboard cameras? Do you have dashboard cameras? Uh, you said you have black box. You have a GPS tracker. What else right. do you have on the board? And how do you factor out all these technologies to price your offering? Right. Yeah, so we, we don't have cameras, that's for sure. So I don't know how many of you guys have used your service, but uh, your cameras, that would be quite an invasion of privacy. So we, we won't go down that route. Um, you know, I think certainly there's, as I said, this sort of black box. There's a lot of sophistication within that. So it gives you a lot of additional functionality. So we, we, don't, we don't do other, and there, you know, it doesn't really make sense to put like six different devices in a car. Uh, so it's better to have one uh, one device that can give you that flexibility. And as I said, it's really it's more more than just the hardware. It's about it's about the software. It's about the analytics. So that's sort of the secret sauce of it. It's sort of how you apply. I mean, hardware in general, hardware is easy. Uh, it's commoditized by and large. Uh, not always. That's why a lot you see a lot of these IoT, these Internet of Things companies uh, can go kind of go under and struggle unless they have a really well baked software and analytics stack that associates with that product. Uh, so. I think that's where we focus and spend a lot of our time, and all, all of our product thinking kind of goes into the application side. How many business models <coughs> were pivoted before coming up with a sustainable model for India, and how much time you gave for each pivot, and what was the team size initially hmm. for each pivot? So we were actually a team of two. So it was uh, both uh, myself and, and David, my co-founder. Uh, so when we initially launched the business, we, we had hired a head of operations, and so it was the three of us that ran the business. We had some call center executives, some fleet executives on the ground supporting us. Uh, but on the business side, it was really the three of us for the first five months of the business. So it was very, very small, very lean. Then we brought on our CTO uh, you know, after about four and a half months and, and then moved from there. You know, sorry, you were asking pivot or pilot? Pilot. Oh. No, so, oh, so, so no, this was the only one. So uh, we, we didn't do anything else. And we, the initial pilot, so to speak, was seven cars in Bangalore at one location in February, March of 2013. So after about six weeks, we realized that it was, it was going pretty well, uh, and then we started scaling up and adding cars. Yeah. Uh, firstly, thank you for, for allowing us to uh, experience uh, uh, luxury cars at a very low price. <laughs> sure thing. And uh, my yeah. question is, 90% uh, of the startups fail when they are scaling up. And yeah. uh, two challenges will be there when a company is scaling up. One is... Qua in ensuring a good quality of uh, human resource. And second mm -hmm. one is controlling the burn rate in order to ensure that uh, your ca investors are with you. How did you ch deal with these challenges? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think one, uh, actually this also dovetails into a, an earlier question. We actually don't discount much at all. I mean, that, that's something where you can check out our website. We don't really run discounts. Uh, it's something we have uh, a dedicated portion. We call it the deal shack. We have a very small amount of our inventory that will allow you to take at a discount. But you know, you're know, you talking about, for us, over 95% of our business, we don't even touch discounts at all. So that's very, very different from other e-commerce players. And I think we're 
again, coming from a finance background, I was a, as an investment banker, as a private equity investor, um, I, I'm someone who, and you can ask the, the guys here from the Hyderabad team, I'm very anal about numbers. I'm extremely anal about burn. And so that's something where you know, I, I look at it on a line-by-line -line basis today, even our P&L. And I'll, I'll look at even, I can even look at G&A items for a city. Like if, I, if I see a, a telephone bill, it doesn't make sense. I'm going to call it out. But I mean, uh, obviously, it's a little bit of an exaggeration. I, I, I don't have time to get into that level of detail. Our CFO and the rest of our team does that. But the point is, that's the culture that we're driving. And then there's no, I mean, obviously, we still have a long way to go. But we, you want to really stamp out waste. Whenever you're doing a business where it's operationally intensive and there, there are some assets involved, whether they're your own assets or other person's assets, I think we have a very different way, a philosophy of running our business than uh, someone like Ola, where they're kind of they're blowing a lot of money on marketing, a lot of money on sort of what I would call it more sense, senseless headcount. Uh, you know, I think that for us, like we like to keep a very lean team uh, from a headcount perspective, where we don't really have anything that we don't need, and we also like to keep a very lean cost structure uh, as it relates to all of our different associated operating costs. Yeah. Uh, any more questions, or I have? Oh, yeah. First of all, uh, thank you very much for coming here. Sure, and I wish you all the very best that you grow more than your expectations. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, secondly, uh, one uh, small suggestion I would like to give. Like what we are facing as a customer nowadays. Whenever you call a call center or customer care, right. they listen to your problem. When they think that the complaint, the complaint is beyond their reach, they'll tell us, wait a moment, we'll transfer your call. Mm. When some other guy comes, I need to explain the same thing to him also. Mm. That is fine, I can explain once or twice. Mm. If I call it, if they call him, if I call them the next time, the same thing I have to repeat. Mm. Okay, fine, you are a startup company now, you are doing well, hope you do even better in the future. Uh, one need that advice what I want to give is, <coughs> Maintaining the customer complaints now will be somewhat easy. When you grow, uh, please make sure that the way you are uh, dealing with people right now, the same standards are maintained. Thank you. Yeah, so you, would you would answer that or just say? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I, I agree exactly with what you're saying. Okay. Uh, it again dovetails into the first point during the, the talk. I mean, I think that, that's something. That's certainly one of the challenges, or actually the third point in the talk, but that is one of the big challenges as you go 2,000 cars at 10,000. And you know, unfortunately, the reality is the absolute number of complaints will always increase, uh, no matter what, right? I mean, like Flipkart uh, on an absolute number you know, has you know, thousands and thousands of complaints, but you know, it's, it's about the relative basis, right? So looking at a percentage of, you know, I'm saying 2% of my bookings have issues. So we, we look at, and again, I'm very financially oriented, very data-driven, as is the whole company. And so we look at the, the relative percentage step down. So, you know, if they say the Hyderabad team, we're, we have 2% of our cases that have like uh, complaints around cleanliness, let's say. Uh, the point is that we want to bring that down to 1.5%. But, you know, 1.5% of uh, 2,000 is larger than 2% you know, of that smaller number. So the, the point is that, yeah, I think you're always, unfortunately, in our business, you're never going to deliver 100% perfection. Uh, but the point is how you deal with the cases which are not perfect, where there was a mistake, how you resolve that, and how do you ensure that you get that customer back in the door so he has a great experience next time? So you, again, build technology, you build automation, you train, uh, and, and that's really the only way to do it. And I think you know, there's, there's no sort of shortcuts. And the reality is it's not going to be perfect, but you want to get it sort of as, as close as you can. We have last three questions. Sure. Hi. So I'm studying environmental management and technology, so it's, I have a question that's from a very different perspective. Mm. Um, so you were mentioning electronic vehicles, I mean electric vehicles, do you have them currently or are you planning on resting in them in the future or? So we were the first company in India to deploy electric vehicles in a okay. commercial fleet. So in 2013, uh, so we, we had, thankfully we had some nice press around that, but it, it, was, uh, it was something where, uh, again, sort of personally, you know, having worked with electric vehicles in the past, uh, it was always near and dear to my heart, but mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't really a PR stunt for us. We actually genuinely believed that there was a real demand that we can actually go out and satisfy. Mm -hmm. It's a great, the Revo, so we had the E2O, yeah. so we had a couple of those in the fleet in Bangalore. Uh, the, the challenges there with scaling, really there's not many electric vehicle products in India. In fact, that's the only one. And now mm -hmm. they're, they're deploying it, Mahindra's deploying it across other vehicle makes. But there's no tax credit scheme. 
There's no additional governmental support outside of Delhi. And even with that, it's a very, very expensive car. So you're, you're kind of saddled with that burden. So you really need to think about uh, different sort of leasing structures or cost disaggregation to make that uh, economic. And unfortunately, India does not allow importation of electric vehicles without a 200% tax. So it is a little challenging. Greg, sometime in future when you exit out of this business <laughs> and you make your few hundred million dollars, would you have your next startup in India or in the U.S.? <laughs> There's a lot of presumptions in that statement, but um, I know uh, I, I would say that you know, I, I think for me, you know, really, you know, I, again, I don't know how long the, the journey will, will go on in terms of whether you know, we'll, we'll keep building for three years, five years, ten years. Uh, I, that's something that's, of course, beyond my control. We want to we'll build this to a, to a great company that you know, I know it'll, it'll still take several years to, to get there. So I think, uh, you know, yeah, at some point in the future, of course, that time would come. But you know, I think for me, even, even if I'm ultimately, say, ten years from now living in the U.S., uh, I think I would absolutely always have my foot in the door in India with, uh, with startup ventures. Because I think there's so many different things, and it's not uh, just you know, opportunities in India and the U.S., but there's so many other places globally where there's opportunities. But I think India has obviously a very special place for me, uh, near and dear to my heart now, where I, I see, uh, having lived here, been part of the culture for three and a half years, I, I know that there are so many other opportunities, avenues that exist, whether it's in agriculture, uh, you know, whether it's in energy, uh, whether it's in waste. Uh, those are probably the three big ones, or, or whether it's water, which is something that I know this city uh, sort of suffers from acutely as well. I think those are the places where you know, the, the next sort of you know, $1 trillion, if you will, come from, from the Indian GDP. And that, that's really where entrepreneurs can excel the most, because that's where the government is uh, really screwing up the, I'd say, probably the, the largest. So. Actually, my question was almost identical to him, and it's the last question. Then I, I have ch I've changed <laughs> okay. it slightly after the <laughs> My question yeah. was this. There you go. What should we do to make you apply for Indian citizenship? <laughs> that's, that's quite an interesting one. No, I, I think uh, so. My business visa expires in about another 14 months, so I have to renew that first and foremost, I guess. So, five year business visa. Uh, so, that was actually, and people ask about the biggest challenges. Fix the damn visa system. That was a nightmare for me. Like getting my business visa actually took me six months, and it was like the most painful process ever. Like that was probably more than anything, almost what made me not start the business. Uh, that was actually a disaster. But uh, that uh, actually, interestingly, that it has in the last two years. I know that that process has gotten so much better. Uh, so you know, that that is something I'm, I'm definitely grateful for. But, yeah.